Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. I'm Thomas, the producer of this podcast, and we are in part two of our conversation with Zach Harney about the historicity of Jesus. A little blast from the past, uh, Zach was a pastor here at Shoreline a long time ago. We had uh, this conversation a while ago, but uh, this is the second part of said conversation. It gives us a little time to prepare for our next series, but uh, I thought this would be sort of a treat. I thought it was a really interesting conversation. It would be a it'd be a shame to just let it uh, uh, fade away. So uh, here is part two of our conversation with Zach Carney about the historicity of Jesus. Well, one interesting thing I heard about the Jesus Seminar, um, and you can fact check me on this, but uh, that that the question of whether Jesus existed um, in the latest one, or at least eventually, what well, wasn't even brought up anymore because. Even in such a secular uh, a group or, or, or such a critical group as this, um, the existence of Jesus was was not even in question. And and I think the person on the street, um, a lot of times, uh, pe- people might think that this is actually in question. What, what is the evidence of Jesus actually existing? What why why is can we be so confident that um, you know despite what he said, what they say he said, that really across the board we get confirmation that, okay, this Jesus was a real character, was a real historical figure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I guess I'd like to just start out that discussion with uh, just looking at some of the evidence we have uh, with some of the historical figures that actually wrote about the figure of Jesus. Uh, but even before that, I'd like to just kind of read a quote by E.P. Sanders, who's probably, if not the most, one of the most respected uh, New Testament scholars of the past 30 years. Um, and But he, he's also very cautiously skeptical and not willing to sort of nail down who this historical Jesus was necessarily. But he does say what he does say is that uh, he, he basically offered a list of statements about Jesus, and he said, um, these statements meet two standards. They are almost beyond dispute, and they belong to the framework of Christ's life, uh, and especially of his public career. Um, so these are the things where he's saying they're almost beyond dispute, even among atheists, agnostic, and, hmm. you know, secular scholars. Uh, he says, Jesus was born around... Uh, 4 BCE, near the time of the death of Herod the Great. He spent his childhood and early adult years in Nazareth, a Galilean village. He was baptized by John the Baptist. He called disciples. He taught in the towns, villages, and countryside of Galilee. He preached the kingdom of God. About the year 30, he went to Jerusalem for Passover. He created a disturbance in the temple area. He had a final meal with the disciples and he was arrested and interrogated by Jewish authorities, specifically the high priest, and he was executed on the orders of the Roman prefect, Pontius Pilate. Hmm, that's a pretty complete picture. Yeah, yeah, I mean, now notice what's missing. Obviously, you yeah. know, they're not saying he healed people, he did miracles, he raised from the dead, any, but what they're saying is, or what he's saying is, there's really no doubt that that Mm -hmm. this person exists. That's really the first step. When you're talking about trying to defend Jesus of the Bible, the first thing you need to do is defend that he actually existed. And that's kind of mainly what we're talking about today is that's the first step. Mm -hmm. You know, did he exist? Because, yeah, you you take a camera down the street and interview people and ask them, you know, what do you think about Jesus? And you probably have one out of five people say, yeah, I don't think he even existed. And they don't realize, like, that nobody, well, I shouldn't say nobody, almost no, nobody that's considered a critical scholar or respected scholar would ever say something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, they think they have some sort of, uh, you know, evidence backing that behind them, maybe that they've heard somewhere, but they don't realize that, you know, even the most staunch atheist scholar uh, is probably never going to make a claim like that because it's just so against the tide of what, most scholars believe about the historical Jesus. Hmm. So that's a, you know, a modern quote, but really a lot of what's built uh, off of the historical Jesus, you know, it, there is much of it that's built off the gospels and separate accounts. But obviously, you know, if you're a, uh, a scholar that doesn't believe the Bible is the word of God, you would like to see some extra biblical sources, mm-hmm. some people commenting on Jesus that aren't, um, 
within the Bible. And so we have uh, multiple accounts of these from pretty uh, soon, at least from a historical sense, after Christ uh, died and rose again. So uh, one example that many of you may know is uh, Titus Flavius Josephus, uh, mo- mostly known to people as just mm-hmm. Josephus. Uh, and he was writing his main works around 93 or 94 CE. So, you know, we're talking around 60 years, a little over 60 years after Christ's um, crucifixion. So um, there's some quotes by him that, that paint a little bit of picture or at least just give uh, the idea that, okay, uh, Jesus was a real person because these guys are writing not long after Christ's mm-hmm. death from a historical uh, standpoint. Yeah. So this is one one quote from Antiquities of the Jews written by Josephus, who is a Jewish scholar, has no reason to try to create a fake character that never existed. Um, mm-hmm. He says, And now Caesar, upon hearing the death of Festus, sent Al- Albinus into Judea as procurator. But the king deprived Joseph of the high priesthood and bestowed the succession to that dignity on the son of Ananus, who was also himself called Ananus. Festus was now dead, and Albinus was but upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before him, or brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, and when he formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. So what he's referencing right here is mm-hmm. the stoning of the brother of Jesus, James, mm-hmm. uh, which is, uh, you know, something that obviously Christians believe and clearly was, you know, believed by yeah. this Jewish historian. And what's significant is that he says, James, the brother of Jesus. Yeah. Now, he doesn't say, you know, someone who claimed to be the brother of this fake person. You know, I mean, yeah. if there's anything that a Jewish historian would like to do, it would be to prove that Jesus never even existed. Yeah. But that's not what he's doing. He's he's referring to them just like any historian would refer to a live, you know, well, not live at that point when he's writing, but as a person who existed in history mm-hmm. was, I, I mean, you, you can think if you're writing 60 years after, you know, this, well, and not even 60 years if you're talking about the stoning of James, but if you're writing 60 years after someone's death, there's people still alive who were alive when that person was alive. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you can't get away with creating this fake character. Mm-hmm. And so that's why, you know, a, an agnostic or atheist scholar is going to look at this and say that's historically significant, mm-hmm. that he's referring to Jesus as a historical reality mm-hmm. only 60 years after this person, you know, existed. Yeah. So that's big. There's another quote um, that I'll read. Now, uh, understand that uh, there's different views on this particular quote. Um, some people think it may have been tampered with. You know, I, I'm not one to decide whether that's true or not, but even people who think that this quote has maybe had things inserted, and you'll probably hear it as I'm reading it, what they mm-hmm. what they think might have been inserted, um, there's no doubt that overall this is representing a, a mm-hmm. true historical figure. And Josephus says in Antiquities of, of, of the Jews, book 18, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people uh, as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. And when, upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to a cross, those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them, uh, spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God have foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. And the tribe of the Christians, so called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. Remember again, this mm-hmm. is a Jewish historian writing this. So uh, essentially, um, you've got a Jewish historian who has no reason to be creating a character uh, that didn't exist because it would hurt you know, the people that he 
believe to be the true religion, Mm -hmm. it would hurt them if he ever existed. And if he could somehow prove that Jesus never existed, it would very much help his case. Uh, But that's obviously was not even something that was being discussed in that time. He he was a historical reality. So that's Josephus. Uh, Another common one that's uh, cited is Tacitus. And he is, uh, he's a Roman historian, not a Christian. Uh, He admittedly hated both Jews and Christians. Um, and you can see this even in the way that he, he writes. Um, but he wrote two main works that we, or at least works that we have, uh, the Annals and the Histories. Uh, and it's really uh, looking at the, the time of ruling of the emperors Tiberius, Claudius, Nero, and uh, those who reigned in the year of the four emperors um, before Titus and some of the other later emperors. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so... In uh, the Annals of Tacitus, he says this, and he's talking about persecution under the Emperor Nero. So this would have been somewhere in the mid 60s. Um, so, you know, at this point, we're talking about this happening, you know, 35 ish mm-hmm. years after Christ. He says, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hate hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, he's referring to Christ there, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out, not only in Judea and the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. (laughs) So obviously not a huge fan of Christianity, but he refers to Christianity and he refers to Christ specifically. Um, And so uh, really we've got another historical source, no reason to refer to Jesus as a real person unless that was pretty much proven fact Mm -hmm. um you know both of these guys have reason to question it it would be good for them if it wasn't true but clearly for them it's a historical reality so they Mm. refer to him just as they would refer to any other historical figure um now the interesting thing is you you know i was uh, doing some research and i found this youtube video of a guy who said well you know we can't trust tacitus because actually uh, Tacitus, instead of being a, you know, historian that's writing, you know, less than a hundred years after Christ, he, it's actually a forgery by a, you know, Italian writer or Italian scholar named, uh, I think it's Poggio, uh, Bracci- Bracciolini, uh, sometime in the kind of beginning 15th century. And so I, I thought, man, he, and he said it with such conviction, you know, he said, yeah. well, we know we can't trust Tacitus because it's a forgery. I was like, wow, that's interesting. So I, I did some research because I've often thought that Tacitus was great evidence for the historical Jesus. And I, the only thing I could find was that in 1878, a scholar named John Wilson Ross suggested in a book of his that it had been forged by this Italian scholar, uh, Bracciolini. Um, but... Other than that, basically nobody nobody agreed with that opinion in his time or since then. And it's just sort of this obscure writer who wrote a book about it. And this guy's sitting here on a YouTube video and saying, oh, yeah, we know it was a forgery. And so you really it just reminded me of how careful you need to be as you're yeah. looking on things like YouTube and different uh, websites. Uh, when people say this is evidence, people are just, you know, they're taking whatever they can get to defend their own belief system. And that's why, you know, to a certain extent, that's what we're all doing. You know, we're trying to use the evidence that we have to support the view that we believe. But you do you do have to have integrity yeah. with that. Kind and of a new, new problem with the rise of the Internet that, that maybe before uh, to, for a book to get, even though it was it was not, by any means, there were there were not uh, we were not free of books with great you know outlandish ideas. But to actually get published, you had to do some work. But now, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you 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 start a you know spend five minutes signing up for a blog, and you can say whatever you want, <laughs> and there there's no shortage yeah. of this. And you have a platform, you know, essentially, yeah. who your platform is as big as yeah. as many people will listen to you on the internet. So you Check don't your sources. Yeah, you don't have to have your platform isn't. Um, 
developed necessarily on the internet by credibility. It may just be interest or availability or, you know, a lot of different things that Mm -hmm. affect or just charisma, Yeah, (laughs) you know? And and so you really do have to be careful who you're listening to and make sure when someone says something and it strikes you as maybe a little bit too simple or odd, do some fact checking, go back and look at that. Um, I want to talk about one more quick source though. And this is found in a letter from uh, Pliny the Younger to Emperor uh, Emperor Trajan. Uh, So Pliny was a Roman governor in Asia Minor, and he's writing this letter, and this is about 112 um, CE, and he asks the emperor about a way to sort of conduct legal proceedings in relation to Christians. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's not, he doesn't have any agenda as far as, promoting Christianity. He's actually mm-hmm. saying, how do I deal with these troublesome Christians? Yeah. And what he writes in this letter is, um, they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called a Uh, called upon to deliver it up after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. And then he kind of goes on and talks about, you know, what, what, how am I supposed to deal with these people? I think at some point he's, he's talking about, you know, I asked them to basically recant their faith. If they don't recant their faith, I send them to be killed. If they do, I let them go. And Mm -hmm. he's, you know, he's kind of processing this whole thing, but what you find out, um, as you read it, is you get to see a little look into there. And and even as he says, you know, in alternate verses, uh, they say a hymn to Christ as to a God. Mm -hmm. And that shows you something right there because what he's saying is they're praying to Christ, not a God, a, Mm -hmm. a man that existed as to a God. So that would have seemed strange to him there's a person that existed and they're praying to him as if he was some God. Yeah. And so that, that little phrase as to a God gives you a little picture into um, how people understood Christianity, but also says he wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't questioning the fact that Christ was a historical Mm -hmm. figure. Um, So, you know, there's other pieces of evidence, but to be honest, it's, it's pretty scant. Uh, There's not a, wealth of historical information on the figure of Jesus. And I'll talk about that reason later. Mm -hmm. Um, So we kind of have to, in this area, take what we can get. But to be honest, we have more information than you would expect. Um, Just with the preservation of some of those sources and things, the fact that we have multiple extra biblical sources on this historical figure is is fairly Mm -hmm. significant. And it's so significant, in fact, that you have... um, atheist and agnostic scholars essentially just saying, you know, who would try to deny that yeah. this guy actually existed? So uh, and g- g- give us quick, uh, uh, a kind of a, rem- a historical context of looking, looking at, at, at dates. So, so somebody listening say, well, the earliest extra biblical source we have is six years later. That seems like a long time, but historically that's not a long time at all. Yeah, no. And, and I mean, really, uh, So let's say, you know, you're looking at someone like Josephus. So that's one of the, basically Josephus, Tacitus, and Pliny the Younger. The reason why they're most often quoted Mm -hmm. and most significant are because they were within less than 100 years of Christ's Mm -hmm. um, death and resurrection. You've got other, like you've got people like Eusebius, who's writing 300 years later Mm -hmm. or more. um, And he's saying very specific things about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he's quoting documents that would be just as old as the other sources we're talking about. But the problem is we don't have those documents. They've been lost. Only through his quote quotations. Exactly. Yeah. They've been essentially lost to history. And so that's why some people would say, well, I don't know if we can trust Eusebius because essentially he's a secondhand source. He's quoting other sources that would have been easily available at his time, Mm -hmm. but have not survived since then. Yeah. And so that's why I kind of stray away from Eusebius a bit, even though he's got some of the most rich and powerful evidence. Mm -hmm. um, You know, people can 
easily brush that away by saying, well, we don't have the sources that he's quoting, so yeah. he could be making it up. Yeah. It's very unlikely that he would do that because if they were readily available in his time to quote, yeah. that means that people could have easily looked at them. You know, not that things were accessible in the sense that they are now, yeah. but people would at least be able to, people in power, if they disagreed with him, yeah. would be able to fact check to a certain yeah, extent. Yeah, this, this was... This was during Constantine's reign where it was fairly easy for people to get a hold of, of this information. Yeah, before if they needed the fall to. of Rome. And, yeah. um, you know, there's still, Rome is still, in a sense, a, a powerful empire. You know, not quite what it had been, but still yeah. powerful. Um, Somebody would have said something. <laughs> if yeah. He was you, just making stuff up. Yeah, you would, you would think so. Um, you know, but still, even with that, you can't say that yep, it's, yep. you know, totally verifiable it's you're still there's a level of faith in eusebius mm -hmm. to be able to say that but the nice thing is for these other guys is those are primary sources you know essentially they're 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 guys that are commenting on what is happening right in front of them mm -hmm. and they're using christ's name to refer to a, a historical person you know 60 70 80 90 years after he was around um, and that is extremely significant I mean, when you think, if you're talking manuscripts, if you're talking um, historical sources, what we have from the Bible and biblical characters is um, insane compared to what we have of some of the other stuff. Now, part of the reason that survives to the level that it does in some of these sources is because um, there's, you know, it, someone treats something like a Bible or uh, a religious source as something sacred whereas uh, a book of history is something that is much less likely to be protected and cared for in the same way that a religious book or a religious source is. Mm -hmm. um, so you tend to have a higher rate of things surviving that are um, somehow related to religion or faith yeah. in that way. But that still doesn't take away from the fact that it's extremely significant. So you know, if we're going to not trust some of these historical sources referring to Jesus as a historical person, we've really got to throw almost all classical history out the window. Um, you know, history of antiquity. I mean, what is, if we can't know that Jesus is a real person, we can't know practically anything from that time period. Mm -hmm. I mean, you consider Alexander the Great, you know, albeit this is um, 300 years before Christ, but when you when you talk, we talk about Alexander the Great, like we've got you know nailed down perfect sources to describe his life and the things he did. Mm -hmm. Well, the fact of the matter is, um, the two earliest biographies that we have of his life are, are written by Plutarch and Arian more than four hundred years after his death, and yet it would be hard for you to find a historian who says like. You know, no, I don't believe that, uh, you know, that Alexander the Great existed. Now, yeah. what someone is going to say, well, he did, you know, his impact is inescapable yeah. from a sense of history. So, yeah, that's kind of silly to say we don't believe Alexander mm -hmm. the Great existed. But the reality is... Well, the this, impact of Jesus is, is slight, <laughs> slightly yes. impacted the world as yes. well. <laughs> but only, you know, Alexander the Great affected the world during his life mm -hmm. in a way mm -hmm. that was so hugely impacting that no one's going to try. I mean, you know, whole cities, states wiped out. Yeah. Um, no one's going to try to argue like that guy didn't exist who yeah. was doing that. Whereas Jesus was much more low profile during his life mm -hmm. and really his... Um, legacy comes after because of the movement of the yeah. church. Um, but but yet you say, okay, 400 years, the f earliest source we have of Alexander the Great, 400 <laughs> years after he did what he did. And you don't hear as many people questioning the historical reliability of those sources. Mm -hmm. And so it tends to be, I think, from a desire to sort of cheapen um, the the historical Jesus just because of an agenda that yeah. they have to to say no well if we can say that you know it's not even reliable to know anything he did then obviously we can't make the claims that we do about him being who he is as Christians mm -hmm. um, but kind of going back to that that idea of uh, you know what do agnostic and atheist scholars think of this well yeah. a really famous name Bart Ehrman he's uh, an agnostic scholar I I believe he either is or was at Duke recently. I think he might still be at Duke. And uh, he wrote a book about Jesus called Forged, uh, Writing in the Name of God. And basically, you know, he's kind of critiquing mm 
uh, critiquing the Bible and critiquing different things from traditional Christianity. But what he does say in that book is he says this, he certainly existed as virtually every competent scholar of antiquity, Christian or non-Christian agrees. Hmm. That's pretty bold. Yeah. <clears throat> so here's another one. Atheist scholar, Michael Grant. He's author of Jesus, a historian's review of the gospels. Another guy kind of going in and ripping apart the Bible and reevaluating mm-hmm. it. But he says this within that book. He says, This skeptical way of thinking reached its culmination in the argument that Jesus as a human being never existed at all and is a myth. But above all, if we apply to the New Testament as we should, the same sort of criteria as we would apply to other ancient writings containing historical material, we can no more reject Jesus' existence than we can reject the existence of a mass of pagan personages whose reality as historical figures is never questioned. Kind of going back Mm -hmm. to what I was talking about. Certainly, there are all those discrepancies between one gospel and another, but we do not deny that an event ever took place just because some pagan historians, such as, for example, Livy and Polybius, happened to be described, happened to describe it in differing terms. To sum up, modern critical methods fail to support the Christ myth theory. It has again and again been answered and annihilated by first-rank scholars. In recent years, no serious scholar has ventured to postulate the non-historicity of Jesus, or at any rate, very few, and they have not succeeded in disposing of the much stronger, indeed very abundant, evidence to the contrary. So what he's saying is, okay, a lot of, you know, the people who do try to debate Christ's existence will say, well, you know, I see differences between the gospel accounts. And what, what he's saying is, you know, any time you have multiple people like trying to chronicle an account of a historical figure, there's going to be differences in mm-hmm. them. And so even from a, you know, atheist scholar who doesn't believe in the truth of the Bible or the continuity of the Bible, he says, just because you see differences between two perspectives, like they're never going to question that a historical figure existed because two people have slightly differing accounts of something he said or something he did. Mm -hmm. And so what he's saying is that's just absurd. Like no scholars believe that he's just a myth that are respected and in that community. Mm -hmm. And then finally, probably, I would say probably my favorite historian of all time, um, Will Durant, who's, he's an agnostic, not a Christian. He writes in uh, Caesar and Christ After two centuries of higher criticism, the outlines of the life, character, and teaching of Christ remain reasonably clear and constitute the most fascinating feature of the history of Western man. Now, this is a guy, Will Durant, who wrote a whole series of books um, kind of chronicling the history of civilization. And it's an 11-book series. Each book ranges from, you know, 600 to 1,500 pages Mm -hmm packed full of history. And this guy who goes from the first book is on the ancient Orient and the last book goes up till kind of the end of the age of Napoleon. So didn't make it quite to current day, (laughs) Um, but he made, he made it quite far. Uh, He says that, that Christ, what he did and taught remains reasonably clear and constitute the most fascinating feature of the history of Western man. And that is significant that he, he, is willing to say that as mm-hmm. someone who isn't even a Christian. Um, so those are just, uh, you know, uh, some of a few examples you could find of quotes of uh, philosophers or scholars who have no reason to propagate the idea that Jesus was a historical figure unless it was actually true. Mm-hmm. And they're almost mocking the people who don't believe yeah. that it's true. Yeah. And so really, uh, you know, as far as the idea of did Jesus exist, The only people you will find who will still say he was a myth or I don't believe he existed are people who have not looked into it and really have very little idea of what they're talking about. Yeah. Well, the next next logical question, I think, is um, it it seems like we have pretty good reason to believe in the uh, confidence of of Jesus as a historical figure, um, and, and even even through the lens of people who are most critical, various uh, elements, a, a good amount of elements of his life, that it's not um, it's not at the very least so twisted that we're we're believing in some totally different figure. But why do we as Christians 
uh, claim that Jesus was God? Why, why do we say he was the Messiah? Um, is there any credit to these claims, or are we just to look at history through this, these lenses that you that you've been providing for us and say, um, well, there's a lot of different opinions, but there's not really any way to know. So um, it's just kind of this almost blind faith that we have to go with. What does the Christian worldview have to say? Uh, uh, what what evidence is there? What reasons is there to say that no, the the, the Christian view of Jesus, while not everybody may agree, is at the very least a reasonable Mm -hmm. worldview. Yeah. So in my opinion, that question of, you know, why do Christians claim he was the Messiah? There's always going to be an element of faith to that. Mm -hmm. And there's actually going to be an element of faith to anything that any historian or scholar believes about a period this far back in history, because Mm -hmm. you're working with limited, you know, physical evidence manuscript evidence. So a lot of what you're doing is inferring. Um, Now, we believe that the Bible is accurate, and so we can use that as a source to discover what was truly going on in that. If you don't believe that, you've got, you know, less to go off of for that period. Probably a whole whole nother topic. (laughs) Yeah, and really, I think what it comes down to is, is because the whole gospel hinges on the resurrection. So we've already seen that none of these scholars disagree that Christ died and was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Mm-hmm. So, okay, you know, we take Jesus from birth to that point, and there's not many people that are going to argue, you know, what the Bible says other than, you know, maybe some smaller aspects of Jesus's life, but they're not going to argue that that didn't exist. So now we hit that point of the crucifixion, and for him to truly be the Messiah and to be who we as Christians say he is, it all hinges on the resurrection, mm-hmm. that he resurrected, appeared to the disciples, like the Bible says, and that's what put for this, forth this movement. Um, now, I, th- I believe from looking at the list of topics that uh, <laughs> someone, whether it's myself or, or somebody else, is actually going to look at that, that Indeed, topic and lay it out probably, you know, um, in an hour or so and talk about the resurrection. So I don't want to go too deep into that, but I do want to, there was a quote that I found that I thought kind of opens the door to this topic. And I thought it was interesting. It was uh, in a a PBS special and there's a woman, Claudia Setzer, who, who's talking about um, this idea of the movement of Jesus. And what she says is other apocalyptic leaders have arisen throughout the course of Jewish history. Bar Kochba and Sabatai Sevi, for example, drew significant numbers of loyal followers, but their apparent failures to bring their transformative vision to reality led to the end of their movements. When Jesus' followers, probably in hiding somewhere, heard he was dead, it did not spell the end of his group. Somehow, hope persisted and was transmuted into a force that changed history. Anyone who looks at maps of established churches in the late 1st, 2nd, and 3rd centuries cannot help but marvel at the rapid spread of Christianity. The persistence and extraordinary growth of Jesus' following after his death is the miracle on which to focus, claims Crossan, going, uh, she's quoting Dominic, uh, Cro- John Dominic Crossan right now, mm-hmm. not the resurrection. So you hear that. The persistence and extraordinary growth of Jesus' following after his death is the miracle to focus on, not the resurrection. Indeed, the transformation of some disappointed messianists into a dynamic movement is one of the most fascinating stories of history. Hmm. And so essentially is what she's saying. For some reason, there was many of these characters in the history of Jewish life of that time that promised certain things to their followers, promised a transformation, promised to bring them something that they were waiting for, Mm -hmm. um, possibly even, you know, saying that they're the Messiah. And she said, time after time, these figures came and went with nothing to show for it. And then she said, for some reason, the followers of Jesus, when he died, decided to continue following him for some strange reason. And for her, there's no <coughs> no possibility that that could be because he, he actually rose. did <laughs> rise from yeah. the dead. But it's because, well, and, and in fact, she says it's a miracle. 
which is an interesting term to use. (laughs) But she says it's a miracle that that following went even after Jesus died. So clearly she doesn't believe in the resurrection. It didn't just Um, go. It it, it was really an explosion. The the rapid expansion of the church um, is, is kind of what she's marveling at. Yeah, and so uh, it's really interesting when you look at those are really I would say the two biggest pieces of evidence that you know from a secular standpoint you can look at to uh, you know if you want to kind of put the Bible aside mm-hmm. and say well how why would I ever believe that Christ was the Messiah the two things you can look at is the historicity of the resurrection which is a whole different podcast mm-hmm. and the growth of the early church and the spread of that which I believe is also another podcast that I'm doing <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> sometime in the future. So I will talk more about that then. Um, but really, that, that's what it comes down to uh, from a, if you're looking from a outside Christianity perspective, why should I believe that? Now, why should we believe that? That's a pretty easy answer because yeah. we believe the Bible is the word of God and it says so. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's not quite that simplistic, but, you know, if you read the Bible, you read the Gospels, and you believe that that's the word of God, then it clearly states, you know, who Jesus was and why he came to this earth. Yeah. So, um, so as Christians, we don't have to set aside our reason and our rationality. And and you mentioned, you know, there, there really is, um, the topics kind of, uh, there's kind of forks in the road at this point. There's a lot of different ways we can go with this and we don't have time. And and as Zach mentioned, we do have uh, a podcast scheduled in the future for, to talk to talk about the history of the resurrection, the growth of the church, a lot of stuff on the the, the history uh, um, of of the early development of Christianity. Um, but uh, j- just for right now, in the nutshell, we, we kind of get the idea that that we really don't have to put aside our reason mm-hmm. that we're not doing this, we're not believing these things without reason in the face of historians and the face of evidence. Um, but, but, but there is actual reasons that, Mm -hmm. that we as Christians will, um, embrace certain supernatural aspects that that there's good reasons. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah. I mean, essentially, like you said, the fork in the road is, are you a pure naturalist or do you believe in something outside of, um, you know, pure material? Mm -hmm. And so if you start down the road and you say, I'm starting with the presupposition that, you know, like natural material that we see in the universe is all there is. There's nothing outside of that. Well, then you have to reevaluate the historical Jesus and and the biblical Jesus Mm -hmm. more specifically, because when you say Jesus does a miracle, that's essentially tapping into something that is supernatural, Mm -hmm. you know, not just purely natural. And so uh, it's changing the natural order of things to make something different come about. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if, if you're going to start with that presupposition, then of course you're going to believe that you can't reasonably accept Christ's resurrection or, um, the Christian perspective on the historical biblical Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, but for those of us who do leave the door open for that supernatural movement and don't believe that simply all there is, is the natural world, then it's not at all unreasonable to, to look at it and say, well, what did what does that look like? You know, yeah. as we look at the biblical Jesus and we believe that that's possible, now we need to look at the evidence behind that and try to, as best as we can, prove that with the evidence that we have. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, um, last kind of uh, a question, and it's about history itself, because we we live in a very postmodern age right now, where you might hear, if you start talking about history, you might hear somebody just quickly rebuttal that. Well, history is is something that um, is told through subjective people. We can't trust history. It's a very relative school of thought. So really, you kind of have to throw everything out the window that was uh, that we don't have, you know, surveillance footage of. Um, can we trust history? Because th- there there is some truth that really history is written by people. Um, why do we trust history? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, obviously every being is a subject yeah. <laughs> and they are subjective. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, every perspective is shaped by, you know, the what has proceeded in that person's life to make them the person they are, what their hopes and desires are, what their fears are. All of these things shape a person 
and will change their perspective, the way they view things, the way they take in information. Uh, so, of course, there's a subject, subjective nature to history. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's, and, and historians realize this too, and that's why they're so rigorous in the way that they look at evidence. You know, they don't just say because they have one source that makes some huge claim about uh, this massive topic that, oh, well, now that's historically reliable. Mm -hmm. But when you have, like in the case of Jesus, more historical references than most of the figures in that time, you know, people aren't going to question history when you're talking about Alexander the Great. The reason they're questioning history when you're talking about Jesus is because they don't want there to be evidence for Jesus or mm -hmm. fear what that might mean for them. Um, you know, some people question the re reliability of history, but I don't think anyone would argue that if, you know, there's all of these historical sources pointing to the same thing, that there's this conspiracy of even, you know, saying that this person existed, you know, that would be yeah. very unusual. And so as I talked about, you know, this idea that the having information of Jesus 60 years after he was um, crucified is extremely historically relevant. And, you know, I mean, there's people nowadays that will talk about, uh, you know, if they're saying, yeah, history is so subjective. I mean, there's people who think everything is subjective and you can't even know what a person, you know, even have a hint of what a person is saying to you when they're saying something and, yeah. you know, the subjectivity of language. And, also, and, you know, I mean, you can go down that trail, but it's pretty frightening. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, people have tried to do it, but it's, it's not very livable, which, you know, isn't any any uh, mark against uh, necessarily its truth, but it, it's just, uh, it, it's not really a way that most people live their daily lives mm -hmm. in, in a way that if you really look at a situation that you can say is true, yeah. I, I personally think. Um, oh, yeah. Take uh, so it's almost the, so the cumulative evidence uh, of, of subjective writers almost is what constitutes uh, historical reliability. So when we when we talk about history, we're not talking about just some subjective guy. We're talking about a group of, sub, of subjective people arriving at, if not exactly the same, very similar conclusions about certain figures. Um, and we can we can consider this stuff reliable. And 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 even even how you mentioned, um, you know, the, kind of the rabbit trail you can go down. We we can just claim that we can know nothing, but, but if you claim that, then you, then, I mean, it's almost an uh, ironic statement in and of itself, isn't it? That, that yeah. how, how do you know that you can get, know nothing because you yeah. can't even know that? Yeah. That's it, an objective <laughs> claim to a certain extent. Yeah. So it, it, if we kind of give it the benefit of the doubt that we have minds and we can uh, trust them to some degree, that history really is something that is, is trustworthy. Yeah, I think that's that's really what this whole issue comes down to. I mean, if you're going to throw history out the window, the whole issue becomes irrelevant, and then it's just literally whatever your mm -hmm. a priori understanding is of any given topic related to history. Um, but I do want to just finish with a quote that will hopefully lead into some of those other discussions about mm -hmm. uh, the resurrection and the growth of the church. I, I think it's a brilliant quote by... Uh, a really great scholar. His name's N.T. Wright. He, you know, some people have referred to him as kind of a modern day C.S. Lewis. I don't know if that's just because he's sort of a chubby, joyous old man from the British Isles or because, <laughs> you know, they're similar uh, in other ways. But uh, what he says is this. He says, I simply cannot explain why Christianity began without it, a real historical resurrection of Christ. Um, I've already said there were many other messianic or would-be messianic movements around in the first century. Routinely, they ended with the violent death of the founder. After that, what happens? The followers either all get killed as well, or if there are any of them left, they have a choice. They either quit the revolution or they find themselves another messiah. We have examples of people doing both. If Jesus had died and stayed dead, they would either have given up the movement or they would have found another Messiah. Something extraordinary happened, which convinced them that Jesus was the Messiah. Hmm. And that really leads into those future topics of the resurrection of Christ and the movement of the church. Why did this dramatic movement happen? And it's a really exciting topic to study. Now, it, 
the the movement of the church is does not have the same um, type of historical significance as a document that mm-hmm. says Jesus existed and is referring to him. It's sort of insinuating from this movement and, and then taking that and looking back and saying what must have been the catalyst for this movement. Mm-hmm. But it's still extremely significant. And to me, the what the disciples did after Christ's death, what the early followers of Jesus did, the rapid spread of the church is probably, in my mind, one of the, if not the greatest, historical proofs for um, the historicity of Jesus and the biblical Jesus that we see in the Bible. Wow. Well, thanks a lot, Zach, for talking to us about the historical Jesus. And and like we've been mentioning, there's a lot of different ways we can go from here. And we've got future podcasts planned. Some of them will be featuring uh, Zach again. Um, but got a lot to think about. We've, uh, we, we've learned a lot. And um, you've given us a few books, uh, uh, book titles. What, what were the ones you mentioned earlier? We, we have Zealot. Yeah, and, and what I will say about this, just so people are clear, is that you know I read these books to get information on the way that um, secular or uh, scholars from other religions depict Jesus, and so I can have a more full understanding of where are people mm-hmm. coming from. You know, I'm not reading Zealot because I'm hoping that he changes my view of mm-hmm. the biblical Jesus, mm-hmm. but because I feel like if you want to engage in conversation that's informed, mm-hmm. you need to know where people are coming from. So, you know, if you're going to read that, you know, understand, you know, you're coming at it from a certain attitude as a Christian. Um, and, and you also have to have your guard up because these, I mean, Aslan, for example, is an amazing writer, an excellent yeah. writer, very convincing. And so as you're going through that, you need to, kind of balance that out with what you know Mm -hmm. is true from the Bible. But uh, nevertheless, a great book. And then uh, The Historical Jesus, Five Views, is I always love books that pull together authors from different views or Mm -hmm. scholars from different views because, you know, inevitably one of them is going to represent the view that you probably already believe. Mm -hmm. Um, Within, you know, this book, The Historical Jesus, Five Views, there's Robert M. Price, uh, who's kind of on one end of the spectrum. Then you've got John Dominic Crossan, who I reference, Luke Timothy Johnson, James Dunn, and Daryl Bach. And, you know, someone like Daryl Bach is going to represent more of the, um, you know, typical what you would think uh, Orthodox Christian viewpoint would be, yep. and, and then kind of going upwards further from that. Yeah. But you get to see these guys interact, and they get a chance to actually... Um, sort of rebuttal the chapter that the other scholar has written. And so Mm -hmm. it's fun to see that interchange and you just see, okay, what are these conversations looking like at the highest levels of scholarship? And that's what makes it interesting. Um, Not because I want someone to convince me uh, that Jesus Christ wasn't the Messiah, but because I want to know yeah. When I'm approaching someone who has a different view than me, you know, what have they read? What, where yeah. are they coming from? What's their perspective? Because that allows me to engage at a deeper level and be able to have more meaningful conversation than just saying you're wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, do you have any uh, resources that somebody might uh, approach where we are trying to get a broad understanding of the historicity of Jesus? And we have books like Zealot and the Historical Jesus, Five Views. Um, is there, uh, I, I know The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel mm-hmm. is a very accessible book. Um, where it's really Lee's own journey and testimony, but it talks a lot about um, uh, uh, the historicity of Jesus and the resurrection. Are there any other books that you have uh, that you would recommend um, that maybe would be uh, uh, supporting a Christian view so we can get um, all sides of this story? Yeah, I mean, as far as uh, books referencing the specifically this topic, the historical Jesus, I mean, William Lane Craig does it in a lot of different books, mm-hmm. uh, uh, reasonable faith he, he answers it in this question uh, this book of questions and so um, he's a great resource if you want sort of a more broad understanding I always love C.S. Lewis I always will you know mere Christianity doesn't really talk necessarily about the historical Jesus but just the reason that we can believe in the Bible and and the reliability of what we say we believe mm-hmm. um, there's things like that there's plenty of you know church histories. Um, I know actually we're both reading uh, an early church history book, which doesn't necessarily go into the historicity of Jesus, but will give you a very good view on kind of the movement after yeah. uh, Christ, Justo Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great one. 
there's, I mean, there's so many resources out there. Obviously you need to be careful with, with what you're doing and do your research and figure out kind of what their background is. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first things I do when I consider buying a book is I'll go to the Wikipedia page and just find out like, okay, is this person coming from a certain background? What books have they written prior to? Where have they spoke? What, you know, and you can start to figure out uh, kind of where people are coming from. And, and that way you're more prepared for the mm -hmm. content as you're going into it. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Zach Harney about the historicity of Jesus. Uh, this was uh, the second part in a two-parter, so next week we will be back to our regular scheduled programming, uh, back to the studio to have another uh, hopefully interesting conversation. And uh, if you if you like these podcasts, make sure to subscribe, whether, that's, uh, whether you're watching them on YouTube or whether you're listening to these on your podcast app. Um, we want to keep making these uh, if people like them. And if you have any feedback about uh, the podcast, some topics you would like to be discussed, some interesting conversations you think would be had, uh, you can email thomas at shoreline.church, and uh, I would love to hear your feedback. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week.